I hope. And I'm going to maximize them. I just need to get you out of my way, life. So exactly where the view button is. Okay. Okay, life. Let me know when you're ready. Oh, I'm ready. Please, uh, Andres Capriano from the University of Bath. Um, thank you very much uh, for talking. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, life. Um, I should say this is the the largest audience I've ever spoken to, um, and also the largest audience that I can't see. I hope you're all well, and I hope you're all keeping well, and certainly keeping your distance from um, those around you, as we are. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, entrance and exit uh, at Infinity for Stable Jump Diffusions. Uh, actually, this is joint work with Life During, um, hence why I'm in communication with him on Sunday afternoons. Um, so. I just want to uh, start by reminding you uh, a little bit of history. So back in the 1950s, William Feller classified um, boundaries for one-dimensional diffusions that live on AB, uh, on the interval AB in one dimension, of course, and A can be minus infinity and B can be plus infinity. And just, you know, I mean, the, there are subcategories, but the, the four main categories were regular, if it's both accessible and enterable, so that means you can get there and you can come out of that boundary, exit if it's accessible, but not enterable, so that means you can get there, but you can't come out of that boundary, entrance if you can come in, but you can't get to that boundary, and natural if neither. So uh, Feller's analysis was largely based around uh, the generator of, of the, the one-dimensional diffusing using Hilliard-Seeder theory. Um, and actually his first trick was to get rid of the drift term. So you can see, I hope you can see my mouse circling around this term here. Um, this term here can be got rid of by uh, changing uh, using the scale function, so changing scale if you like, so there's a natural harmonic function associated with this operator and you load up the diffusion into that harmonic function, you get um, a local martingale, whoops. Um, and so one can also check that under that transformation, the boundaries transform also to another A and another B, so we're still asking the same question for this SDE, but now on a, a different interval. So it suffices to look at um, this simple SD here. Um, and the interesting cases, are, or, or not necessarily the only interesting cases, but interesting cases are when A is minus infinity and B is plus infinity. And actually for us in a bit, it will be when A and B are both minus infinity and plus infinity. And so what we're interested in is entrance at these uh, boundary points. So suppose we set B to be plus infinity and A to be uh, minus three, for example. We want to know if we can enter from plus infinity, from the boundary plus infinity. Well, and that's what we're calling it. It has been increasingly commonly been called coming down from infinity. Um, so Feller resolved this issue with his analysis and, and he showed that uh, plus infinity is an entrance boundary if and only if this uh, integral test holds. And you can, just to remind you, sigma appeared here in, this would be the new sigma here in this SD. So the sigma you see here would be the sigma tilde you saw on the previous SD. So sigma is growing slightly more than linearly at infinity. Okay, so this notion of coming down from infinity, um, so it, it, as I said, it's more common to call it that way uh, recently, and this is because we see it appearing in other types of stochastic processes, and also differently from the Feller situation, stochastic processes which undergo uh, jumps, so with path discontinuities. So here's another classic example, the famous one. So this is Kingman's coalescent, which I trust most of the people in the Zoom room know about. So this is simply a, a model for merging blocks or equivalently for genealogical evolution backwards in time, if you look backwards in time. 
Um, so blocks merge at a constant rate, so any two blocks merge at a constant rate. So if you have n blocks, they merge at rate n choose two, and um, or n choose two times the constant rate that any two blocks will merge. Uh, so it's you can think of the number of blocks as a Markov chain, a death chain. And a natural question here is, can I start with an infinite number of blocks? Um, and that's the question about coming down from infinity, a Markov chain entering at plus infinity. So you're extending the state space of the Markov chain on the natural numbers to include the boundary point plus infinity. Um, here's another WYSI example. So this is some work I did recently with uh, student Stephen Padgers. Paget, Chris Rogers, and Jason Schweinsberg. So a slight adaptation of that model. So change the uh, the, the death chain uh, and add in the, the feature that uh, at a constant rate, each block will break. So blocks are merging. You see here at the constant rate, C, any two are merging at constant rate, C. So uh, A merger will occur at rate C times I choose two if there are um, C if there are I blocks in the system, but then we're going to split each block at rate lambda, so total rate lambda I if there are I blocks in the system, and we're going to smash them into an infinite number of pieces. So we're going to send the system up to its boundary point plus infinity. And so the question uh, one might ask is, can one come down from infinity? Is is infinity? Um, a point that we can include in the state space and expect a sensible process. So the right way of asking that is, is do we get a recurrent process when we include the boundary point plus uh, infinity here? Um, uh, and actually the answer in this case turns out to be that we have a parameter uh, regime here. So if we set two uh, lambda over C to be theta, uh, then we can get recurrence from theta between zero and one and the the process will actually enter repeatedly from plus infinity in the sense that we get um, an excursion process going on from plus infinity so there's no first if you like incursion from plus infinity but there are there's an excursion that we can build um, and then place that end to end through an eto synthesis and we get a, um, a stochastic process where infinity is recurrent and otherwise, if theta is bigger than one, then we get theta as an absorbing state. Okay, one more example. So here's an SDE. Um, this is the classical uh, branching uh, continuous state, branch, diffusive continuous continuous state branching process. And then there's an adjustment term here. This is, I believe, what Lam, Alain, Amari Lambert considered. This is a this is kind of like coalescence here. One can think of a competitive term here. Good. Going on and entrance occurs at plus infinity for this model but then more generally if we go to continuous state branching processes uh, in their full generality this is work that Berestiki, Fittipaldi and Fombona have done so here is the SDE that you would normally write down so all that I'm not really covering it up properly but this bit here is the main SDE for continuous state branching process and there's the competitive term that they considered and there is a question, well, this is now jumping, this one isn't, so in a sense this fits Feller's original situation. Um, this one isn't, uh, can we still talk about coming down from infinity? So I want to address uh, uh, the setting of a, what would be called a jump diffusion these days um, and ask the question of can we come down from infinity for this process, but I'm going to ask the question, with a slightly different notion of infinity. So here's my stable jump diffusion. So here X is a stable process. It's exactly the same as Feller considered, except I replaced the Brownian motion with a stable process. They are one dimensional stable process. Um, sigma is going to be uh, continu continuous and bounded away from the origin. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with um, stochastic calculus of jump processes, I have to take the, the left limit here of uh, ZT for the sake of provisibility. Okay, so I'm in. Can this enter us infinite? 
can it enter from minus infinity? And actually now, because of jumps, can it enter from the, um, the one point compactification of the real line, which is plus minus infinity. So the, the union of the two infinities, if you like. Now, before this wasn't considered for the setting of, um, this wasn't considered before for the setting of Feller, because if you imagine this to be a continuous path, there's no way we can think about starting at plus and, and minus infinity because we need somehow to oscillate infinitely often at arbitrarily small times, which means I would have to continuously pass through any neighborhood of the origin and that would slow the SDE down. There wouldn't be enough time to get back and forward coming in from plus and minus infinity. But now we've got jumps, that might happen. Okay, so let me be clear about what I mean. Um, about uh, a stable process because different people understand different things. So this is a rather full slide. So a stable process, I mean a Markov self-similar Markov process, um, a Markov self-similar Markov process, which is also a Levy process in one dimension, of course, always one dimension. And it has uh, a scaling property being a self-similar Markov process. So if I multiply the process by a constant here, and I scale uh, in time as such there, with c to the minus alpha, and alpha is going to be a special parameter, then when I start the process from x, what I'm looking at is equal in law to itself again, albeit if this one started at x, then this that it's equal in law to starts at c times x. Alpha is the index of self-similarity, and necessarily, if this is going to be a Levy process, then the index has to be between zero and two. You'll immediately start complaining about this bracket here. It should be a closed bracket, but I want to exclude the parameter alpha is two because as you all know, that's Brownian motion. That's been done. So we're throwing that out the window for now. Okay, um, now, as a Levy process, we describe its, um, its evolution, its, its semi-group, uh, essentially by its, um, its passage from time zero to time one, from zero to wherever it gets to in time one. So we look at the Fourier transform. This gives us an exponent, psi z, and psi z is characterized in a special case. You may recognize this formula. Um, this is the low hinge in exponent for a stable process. Actually, most of you will recognize this part of the formula here. I'm sorry, I'm not able to blue that out at the moment. Um, recognize this bit, but I've written this in a slightly different way to the usual way. So there's usually an alpha and beta parameter, um, alpha being the index here and beta being the symmetry parameter. But actually, I've rewritten it in this format where rho is the uh, positivity parameter. Um, and that's just for more presentational convenience. Um, now, as most of you know, associated to, oops, associated to every levy process is its jump uh, measure. So here it is absolutely continuous with respect to the vague measure. And the parameter rho here appears, um, and anytime you see a hat, by the way, hat means we're talking about whatever that value is, but for the negative of the stable process. So if you like in the Levy terms, the dual of the Levy process. So here we've got um, a, a, a rate at which we're seeing positive jumps of size x. So when x is teeny tiny, we're getting an arbitrarily large rate of arrival. And this is the rate at which we see jumps um, which are negative and of size x. So sorry, it's proportional to one over mod x to the one plus alpha, and this is the constant here. So rho is um, rho is uh, the coefficient which kind of deals with the symmetry going on here. Some of you know the setting that uh, a stable process is a subordinator, so that would be the case that we switch off entirely um, the negative jumps here. I'm sorry, I told my children not to be noisy during this hour, and <laughs> exactly this is what they're doing now. Um, so, and here, um, if I take rho 
is I can take rho to be one and alpha to be between zero and one, that would switch off this here. That would make this into the only contribution in the levy measure, you'd have your increasing levy subordinator. Some of you know uh, a stable process to be in the symmetric sense, so that would mean rho is a half. And if alpha is one, you've got back to your Cauchy process. Sorry, that keeps flipping. Okay, so I don't want to dwell too much on that, but for those of you who are familiar with it, with stable processes, I mean the full class of stable processes, but I'm actually mostly going to focus in this talk on the setting that uh, rho is between zero and one, so I get a contribution in both positive and negative jumps. Okay, so the first issue I need to address is whether, is whether um, the uh, SDE makes sense. So um, when alpha is between zero and one, we need to be a little bit careful. When alpha is between one and two, we're, we're pretty much good. So, so when alpha is between zero and one, we need to take care of this explosion time here. Oops, that's not going down too well. This explosion time here. So the solution, I can identify the solution to this, I, this SDE in the weak sense as simply a time change of the stable process. And the time change here is the inverse of this clock. And this clock here is built from the sigma and the SDE. And uh, if this total integral is finite, then we've got a problem. Then we get an explosion in the time change. Um, and so, there it goes again, sorry. And so if alpha is between one and two, this doesn't explode. And that's basically because X is recurrent, uh, it visits the origin infinitely often. And so it keeps this integral growing and growing and growing. And if alpha is between one, zero and one, um, then we have a transience and the process uh, can can kind of drift out to the outer regions of space. It kind of evacuates all compact domains uh, containing the origin, and then this thing will become finite, and we get an explosion. So sometimes I'm going to talk about the SD up to explosion, uh, but actually I'm not sure I'm going to mention that again because I'm going to work uh, probably in this environment only in the near future, alpha between one and two. Okay, so what do I mean by an SDE um, uh, entering at plus minus infinity or plus infinity or minus infinity for, uh, for this setting here? So what I mean is that the point, so let's take plus minus infinity. Uh, the point plus minus infinity is not accessible. Um, the, if I take the semi-group that is induced by the law of the, the SDE, it's a Markov process, um, then I can extend the semi-group onto um, the completion of the real line by plus minus infinity. And uh, the, I, so I can talk about, uh, you see here these PXs, so I can talk about P plus minus infinity as part of the Feller extension. So I have also the Feller property holding on the complete domain here. And I need also this property that the, um, the process, which is written here as y for now, the process as t tends to zero, its modulus blows up and its limb sup blows up to plus infinity and its limb inf blows down to minus infinity. So it means as I look back in time towards the origin, I see the process exploring larger and larger distances away from the origin both in the plus and the minus direction and now once you've seen that definition for plus minus infinity you can pretty much imagine how to adjust it for plus infinity or minus infinity um, as i said i'm going to talk about this case here uh, plus minus infinity i'm going to restrict myself to alpha between uh, one and two as well. But here's the full result uh, that we have for this SDE. 
So these are all the possible values of alpha here. Here's the fella case at the very end. This column tells me whether I have only positive jumps or negative jumps or both jumps up and down. And so we see here that there's no, for alpha between zero and one, there's nothing doing. I cannot enter from plus infinity. I cannot enter from minus infinity. I cannot enter from plus minus infinity. Once alpha is one or greater than one, then we start to see some action. So we can enter at plus minus infinity if and only if we have an integral test. Here it is up here at the top. Okay, so we get this log term. So it's a bit like fellas, except we get this log term and that's special to the case alpha is one. Um, otherwise, when we look at alpha between one and two, then we can come in from plus infinity only if we have positive jumps and if and only if then we get this uh, criteria holding. So this integral test is up here at the top. And this integral test is much closer to the, the Feller test. So you can see that if alpha is two, it is the Feller test. Um, and then of course, similar behavior uh, when we enter from minus infinity, except we need now only negative jumps. And if we want to enter from plus minus infinity, that can only happen when we have plus and minus jumps. And in that case, um, the integral test I should say you should take notes here of the R plus and the R minus here and the R. So that's telling you where the integral test is happening. So if we want to enter uh, from plus infinity, we need to have the integral test holding over the positive half line. If we want to enter from plus minus infinity, we need, to, we need the integral test to be over full real line here. Okay, and that's Feller's result down there at the bottom. Okay, um, how do I move on? There we go. So, I think I've gone too far here. I'm going to start, um, I'm gonna give you some background. I'm gonna give you a sketch proof of this, but I want to give you some background to this first. I want to introduce you to this lovely Polish result of Bob, um, Christoph Bob and Thomas Sack. This is to do with space-time transformations of stable processes. And um, it goes as follows. So suppose you have your, your stable process. Again, I'm going to insist on two-sided jumps. Um, actually, I don't care what my alpha is for now. Uh, and I've got another clock here. So this clock eta is the inverse of this integral time here so we're building up time depending on where the stable process has been and then we take the inverse of that so if i take one over the stable process so i invert the path if you like this is an inversion through the unit interval minus one one and then i time change then what i'm looking at um, is not a stable process again, but something that's nearly the stable process again. So first of all, uh, I'm going to look at this not under p, but under p hat. So remember, p hat was the law of minus x. So if you like, what I could be saying here is just stick a minus sign up in front of this, and this is going to be considered under p x. Okay, so what does that give me? It gives me a self-similar Markov process, and it's equal in law to something very closely related to the stable, which I'm calling X with probabilities P circle. And of course, if this guy starts under X, then the, the transformation starts at one over X. So what is this? So it is actually the stable process, but under a dupe H transform, and the H transform is um, proportional to this harmonic function mod Z to the alpha minus one. This mess in front of it is uh, almost a constant. It's just a constant that changes according to whether Z is positive or negative. Okay, so if we took a symmetric process, then H of Z would indeed be mod Z 
to the alpha minus one. So um, what we're saying again, just to rehearse this, so I'm saying I take the stable process, I invert it, I negate it, I time change it. So I've made a space time path transformation and it's equal in law to the stable process again, except dup H transformed by this rather, um, almost rather pretty uh, harmonic function. Okay, so question is, what is this process here? What is this P-circle? What does it mean? What is it in relation to the original stable process? So it's a dup H transform of, of it, but what does that mean? Well, it turns out I can relate the P-circle um, to the original stable process via this form of conditioning here. So luckily, um, all the ducks were in the row already for us. So there was some work of Chamont and Panti and Rivero, um, and Cousinets of Pardo and Watson. That might be me actually. And uh, this looks at conditioning the uh, stable process. So in this case, to avoid the origin. So when alpha is between uh, one and two, you can have a look at this and think, well, what happens when X tends to infinity? When X tends to infinity, uh, we, it, we, um, uh, we reward paths, sorry, when, alpha tends, when X tends to infinity. And when X tends to zero, we punish paths in the DuPage transform. So not surprisingly, this P-circle uh, process corresponds to conditioning the process to avoid the origin in this sense here. So T0 is the first hitting time of the origin, and this is a, a notion of conditioning the process to stay away from the origin in the long time. Here F is an event up to time T, and here I'm saying keep it away from the origin at time T plus S and then take S to infinity. It's rather a classical way of doing it. In the setting that um, alpha is less than one, if we go back here, we see that we punish paths which go far away from the origin and we reward paths that go close to the origin. And so it turns out actually that this would correspond not to conditioning to avoid the origin, but it corresponds to approaching the origin continuously um, by oscillating around the origin closer and closer and closer and then eventually hitting it. However, I think I've, I've only described this because we're again sticking to this setting of alpha between one and two. Again, I'm sorry about the oscillation in the slides. Um, let's skip this bullet point here. That's for specialists. Um, now, what is in that slide, the executive summary of the last uh, bullet point there, is that this process here, we can make sense of it um, actually starting from the origin. So it's a process which avoids the origin. So it's, con it's a stable process condition to never visit the origin, to, to stay away from the origin. Um, but we can start the process from the origin. So actually, this, this, um, this statement I'm making here, which is that uh, the law of the process started from Y converges in the weak sense with respect to the Skorohot uh, topology uh, to, the pro to a process starting from the origin. Um, this, in a sense, is another example um, of uh, the kind of fella type entrance law we're interested in. And in fact, you'll quickly realize that I'm sweeping the entire problem um, of entering from plus minus infinity under the carpet by just telling you this bullet point is true that I can condition from uh, and that is the whole basis of the proof. I use this, I use this to my advantage. We start with this circle process, we start with this stable process conditioned to avoid the origin, and then I'm going to transact transform and through the SDE representation, and I'm going to make sure 
that the, all that behaves itself and I can then map this entrance at zero to entrance at plus minus infinity. And the integral test that you see um, in the theorem is what's going to allow me to control um, that proof, if you like, or control that logic. Okay, so I'm gonna run that through with you. So my first step now is to kind of take the bogdan zak transform and look at it again in the context of this SDE. So you remember that this SDE has a weak solution and the weak solution is a time change of the stable process. But you also remember that the bogdan zak transform says do a space time change of the stable process and you get to this condition stable process. So if I mash those things together, we get the following. Whoops. So here we go. So here's a function beta. So it's something like the time change function that appears above, except I've got one over x in it. And then I've got the time change function that appeared in the Bogdan Zak transform. So now I'm going to kind of say things in reverse here. So I'm going to take the law of the stable process conditioned to avoid the origin. I've put a hat on it. So what I really mean is I'm going to take the negative of the stable process, which is just a stable process with the roles of row and row hat interchanged, the symmetry interchanged, if you like. So I'm going to take x hat circle, so the, state, the negative of the stable process conditioned to stay positive. I'm going to invert it. I'm going to whack it through a time change. So here's the time change. The time change is based upon the beta clock here with beta up there that we just talked about. And what comes out of that transformation is Z. Don't worry about the dagger for now. The Z is equal in law uh, to the, the weak solution of the SDE. And if I start X circle hat starting from one over X, then the Z process will start from X. Okay, so what I've done is I've, I've represented my weak solution to the SDE as an inverse one over of the negative of a stable process condition to stay positive. Now, let me just tell you about the dagger. The dagger is there because the transformation here will only tell me about the SDE until it first hits the origin. Um, and it will hit the origin because X can hit the origin and the time change is such that I can reach the time that X will allow me to hit the origin through here. Okay, so that's why I put the dagger on there, but more or less that doesn't matter because I'm only interested in trying to get this process Z to start from plus minus infinity. Okay, so you can already see from this representation that starting this Z solution of the SDE from plus minus infinity is an issue of starting this X hat circle process from zero. And this is coming back to my comment that I kind of cheated here by just telling you, well, this is a process condition to stay positive. Uh, to stay away from the origin and you should trust me, I can also start it from zero. So that's me sweeping the whole thing under the carpet. But I'm going to use it here. Okay, so let's run through heuristically the proof that um, this integral test, which appeared in the theorem, implies that plus minus infinity is an entrance point for this SDE or the solution, the weak solution to this SDE. Okay, so as we've said on the previous slide, so Z is equal in law to time change X. That's this bullet point here. It's rather difficult sometimes to blue things out. I'm so sorry, I'm a bit chaotic. So Z is equal in law to time changed X. And so if X is entering at plus minus infinity, then one over, sorry, if Z is entering at plus minus infinity, then one over Z, or indeed one over Z dagger, I don't really care about hitting the origin later, is entering at zero, but it's crossing the origin infinitely often for arbitrarily small times. That's an important 
feature of this bullet point to this bullet point. Entering it plus minus infinity means I'm going to have to cross infinitely often the origin. Um, and so when I invert it, it is going to cross the origin infinitely often still. Okay, so according to my previous theorem, so if one over z dagger is entering at zero and crossing the origin infinitely often, then I want this x circle hat, so the negative of the stable process, conditioned to avoid the origin with a time change of this theta. This guy needs to enter at zero, crossing the origin infinitely often for arbitrarily small times. Okay, and that's from this previous result just here that we spoke about. I remember the theta is with the beta transform. Now, that should happen because I told you a stable process conditioned to avoid the origin can enter at zero. However, we mustn't forget about the time change. So it can enter at zero, providing I can control the time change. And so to control the time change, if we whiz back again to this slide, so the time changes by this theta here, the theta is the inverse of this integral clock here, which is based on this beta function here. So I need to control um, this integral in essence as the stable process condition to avoid the origin or the hat stable process condition to avoid the origin tends to zero. So I need to make sure this thing doesn't blow up. It doesn't do anything stupid. And so as I drag um, here, the, the starting point of x hat circle to zero, the theta time change behaves itself as well. Now, I'm, of course, I'm glossing over a lot of detail, though, but this is just the, the, the rough outline of it. So to control this integral, it's enough to control its expectation as x tends to zero. Okay, so don't forget it's beta of the stable hat process conditioned to avoid the origin. Controlling that, it's enough to control the total integral here up to infinity. <coughs> and then take the limit as the starting point tends to zero. Okay, well, here I've got some notation at the bottom. So I'm using this term here for a resolvent of a Markov process y. So any Markov process y has resolvent gx dy. So back up here, I want to control this guy here. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to first write it out in terms of its resolvent. So there's the beta function appearing here. This is the resolvent of the negative stable condition to avoid the origin. Now, luckily, nice little trick is the resolvent of the condition process, being a DuPage transform, is the resolvent of the, the process killed on hitting the origin with the h function that we defined earlier that was more or less mod z to the alpha minus one. And so there it is, I've filled it in. I've forgotten about constants. I've thrown all the constants away. I don't care about constants. That's not going to affect um, the integral. And this resolvent here, I thought this would be in the literature. So I went hunting. So I want the resolvent of the negative of a stable process of a stable process again, a stable the, a, the resolvent of a stable process killed on hitting the origin. Well, I couldn't find it, um, so I had to prove it myself. And here it is. It's a rather nice, cute formula here between this bracket and this bracket here. And then, of course, as I take x to zero, um, lots of convenient things happen. Well, I have a little bit of a problem down there, but if you're prepared to trust me, the whole thing is controllable. And essentially, if this integral is finite, then you can make sense of this limit here, this guy here. Okay, which is exactly controlling this expectation, which is exactly controlling the weak convergence of this functional, which is exactly controlling the time change, which is exactly controlling this guy being able to enter at zero, which is exactly controlling 
1 over the solution of this SDE entering at plus minus infinity. Okay, so I've done one direction, I've done a sufficient direction. What about necessity of that integral test? Now this is the dodgy direction. So this is the direction where I'm going to give you a scratch, a, a scratch proof, um, but it's a terrible scratch proof because it's all lies, but it captures the, the essence of what is really going on for the rigorous proof. So we're going to start with um, this proposition, which is based around Hunt Nagazawa duality. So Hunt Nagazawa duality is about taking a Markov process and time reversing it. So, in particular, the, the paper of Nagazawa in the late 60s, 60s gives us um, nice criteria that we can check. So, if I take a, a forward moving Markov process, and I have a suspicion that if I time reverse it, and even that needs a careful definition, if I time reverse it, I'm seeing another uh, Markov process. Uh, the Nagazawa paper gives me nice criteria to verify whether my suspicions are true or not. Okay, so here is a proposition which is essentially verifying what I think is the time reversal of a relevant Markov process that appears in our setting. So I'm going to start, as always, with this uh, core object, which is the stable process conditioned to avoid the origin, or the negative of a stable process conditioned to avoid the origin. Um, and I'm going to time change it. And I'm going to time change it, call the time change Z hat circle. And the time change is, at the moment, it's an arbitrary <laughs> chosen time change. So this iota t is a little bit arbitrary. So there's no apparent reason for it at the moment. However, um, what I'm saying is if plus minus infinity is an entrance point for the solution to the SDE, then I'm quite within my rights to pick um, a last exit time, this K is going to be a last exit time, and I can time reverse the process from that last exit time, any last exit time. And here I've just got a little minus sign because I need to uh, make pads Cadillac again. Uh, going forward, I have Cadillac when I reverse them. They're not Cadillac anymore, but if I put a little minus sign, that deals with that. Okay, so if I time reverse, um, my solution to my SDE, okay, killed and hit until hitting the origin, uh, up to some last exit time, like the time when I first hit the origin. Um, and I do that with it with Z starting from plus minus infinity. Then what I'm looking at is another continuous time Markov process. And that continuous time Markov process agrees with the one that I have built here with this unusual choice of time change here, or this at the, at the time of introducing it, this arbitrary, uh, arbitrary choice of time change. Okay, so this is simply a verification using Nagazawa's duality criteria. In fact, Nagazawa wants us to check that my two assumed dual processes, so that would be Z dagger, and then this process here, so Z killed on hitting the origin, and this one here, they need to fulfill some kind of detailed balance equations, if you like, if you want to call it that, uh, with a reference measure, and the reference measure is a little bit complicated, it's built up from the starting measure um, of uh, Z circle hat and its resolvent, which actually turns out to be this rather cute uh, measure here. Okay, so keep that in mind. So what I'm saying is, if I time reverse the process entering at plus minus infinity from a last exit time, for example, the time it first hits the origin is a last exit time, um, or I can treat it as a last exit time, then when I time reverse, I see a process which explodes to plus minus infinity. Um, and 
the two are time reversals. One is time reversal of the other. Okay, now here's the dodgy bit. Um, and I know that we have got some people in the audience who are grandmasters um, in this particular arena. So um, I'm going to make my apologies immediately for the carelessness with which I'm stating this. So if I want to understand um, a necessary condition, integral condition, for this process to enter at plus minus infinity, if I want to show that entering this at plus minus infinity necessarily implies that this integral test holds here, um, then what I can do is I can, I can kind of think of um, this one, one point addition as a compactification of the space. And then I look at Gator's, uh, Gator wrote this nice paper in the 80s saying, well, look, everybody's got their definition of transient. So basically they're all equivalent. equivalent. So on the one hand, some people define it as last exit from a compact set being almost surely finite for any starting point. And on the other hand, um, some people see it as saying the resolvent on any compact domain is finite. Well, so if this thing is starting at plus minus infinity, um, or better said, if Z dagger, the process when it first hits the origin, starts at plus minus infinity and it enters, no problem, it's feller, it works its way all the way down to absorption at zero, then that sounds pretty transient to me. Okay, and in fact, because this space is compact itself, we could say, well, that means that must mean that the resolvent of the SDE is, uh, well, I should have a dagger here, the SDE killed on hitting the origin is finite over the whole domain because the whole domain is compact. Um, but, but on the other hand, this Hunt Nagazawa duality says, well, my occupation of the whole domain, again, apologies, there should be a dagger here. Um, uh, my occupation of the whole domain until first hitting the origin when entering at plus minus infinity. Well, if I time reverse that and I look what's going on in the re reverse, well, I've hit the origin. So I start at the origin and then I blow up to plus minus infinity. So my occupation moving forward in time, starting from plus minus infinity, must be my occupation um, moving backwards in time, starting from zero. Now that's a really dirty version of the truth. So, so apologies, uh, it needs a little bit more rigor than what I'm saying, but that's the crux of it. Um, and so if I look at this thing being finite, so this needs to be finite because it's equal to this. And if we're saying this enters and then can hit the origin from plus minus infinity, this must be finite by the criteria of transients on a compact space. Um, and so I just verify what this object is. Um, it is, remember it's a time change of a dube H transform of the stable process hit, hitting the origin. So here's the resolvent of the process hitting the origin. Here's the dube H transform and here's the time change happening. And again, if you're willing to trust me a little bit of fiddling around, I actually need this X to be zero. I haven't set it to be zero because you're gonna have a problem down here already, but a little bit of trust, uh, this thing can be sorted out to look like or to be necessarily forcing this integral to be finite. Okay, so essentially entering at plus minus infinity of this SDE, because it's the time change in law of a stable process, and because of this Reese Bogdan Zach mapping uh, the origin to plus minus infinity, and because of time reversal, we can get the, uh, the main result that we had all the way back down here, this red one here. So alpha is between one and two, and we're looking at up and down jumps. Okay, if and only if this integral test over the real line is finite. 
Okay, life has come online, which means he wants me to shut up. Um, I've only got a couple more slides, life, if you'll indulge me, and they take virtually no time at all. So I've done two sided jumps. Um, I'm going to skip that. But I want to say you can, if you think about the reversal, then the reversal is converting um, entrance into explosion. So actually, we could redo our analysis and look at what do we need for explosion to occur in that SDE? If you remember right at the beginning, um, we have to be a bit careful about that when alpha is less than one. And not surprisingly, we get a table here where I get um, criteria, uh, if and only if necessary and sufficient conditions for explosion, um, with down jumps, up jumps, up down jumps, explosion to infinity, explosion to minus infinity, explosion to plus minus infinity all the actions happening exactly where we didn't get any action for the entrance from plus minus infinity and that's with alpha between zero and one thank you very much hey um thank you andreas um unfortunately now you ran over time and we cannot try our game uh with hands up oh perhaps uh, one but you stole some time really from it at the beginning <laughs> well let's try it once uh, with robert along um so now you should. Um, hello, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, both for the beautiful lecture and for organizing this. Um, my question is actually more a comment um, than a than a question. Um, during your lecture, I apologize for practicing what most of us usually do during a lecture anyway, which is work on other things, and that actually worked quite well. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. Okay, we do one more. Milton, you should be unmuted. Okay. And so you should. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, uh, of course. Uh, first, uh, thank you. I want to thank you both of you for this uh, very nice initiative. Uh, I took my chances to uh, to make this uh, program mandatory for students at IMPA, which are currently uh, back at their homes and so you will have uh, some uh, some extra audience uh, for uh, guaranteed for ne for next weeks uh, but okay the question is that uh, so when you have diffusions and uh, and um, you know uh, that the boundaries are entrance or uh, regular etc i know how to um, set up uh, nice boundary conditions for the generators so can you do the, the same thing in this case? I mean, uh, to set up the nice boundary conditions for the for the generators of the, of these diffusions, the jump diffusions. Uh, yeah. So in principle, I would say um, it, it, so, so. Of course, the generator of a stable process um, can be a little bit of a nasty beast. Uh, it's an integral differential. Well, it's an integral operator. Um, the Gaussian component. So um, it. If you are strong enough on the analysis, I would say yes. Um, ultimately, it should be doable. But I, I'm not convinced that the literature is mature enough um, in that. Uh, aspect problem at the moment. So the understanding of the problem offending half of the people in the in the seminar here. I, I, it's probably more that this is my way of dealing with things. I was particularly interested in the representation of the solution with life through time changes. Um, I, I, somebody might come back and say, yes, this can be done analytically through the generator. I'm a little bit suspicious that that's not doable. I didn't feel the literature was mature enough for that yet. Um, and that, it is because of the nature of the generator being rather nasty. Okay, and thank you. Thank you again, Andreas. And uh, now we need to try to change the setup uh, to Nathaniel.